Codex, uh, Dr. Simon Yunus. So uh, just let me briefly uh, tell you about Dr. Yunus. He received his uh, Bachelor of Degree in Chemistry from Central University of Venezuela. Yeah. So I presume he was born even there. Right. Uh, then he received <coughs> his Master's and PhD degree in Physical Chemistry from the Catholic University of uh, Louvain in Belgium. And then uh, he went on uh, to work with uh, a lot of uh, professors, uh, in, especially in the field of uh, catalysis. Then uh, Dr. Yunus has joined Microbiotics in May 1984. So he has almost 34 or 35, 35 years. years of experience. And they are not allowing him to retire even. <laughs> so uh, he held the position of senior application scientist and uh, he conducts, of course, a lot of uh, absorption experiments. He even participates in the design of the machines, the famous uh, and nice machine that we have uh, over there in our lab. So uh, Dr. Yunus is recognized worldwide for his contribution in the field of adsorption and the application, application of adsorption techniques to the characterization of solids and particularly catalysts. So okay. please uh, join me all uh, to welcome Dr. Yunus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank for your. Uh, okay, as you know, my name is Simon Jun, I'm Simon Junius. I was born. Uh, sorry. I was born in Venezuela and uh, I moved to the United States in 1984 and still was Micromatics 35 years ago. I participate in the manufacturing of new or rebuilding new techniques every time, physics option and chemist option. Uh, I've been traveling to the whole world many, many days. I have two million miles flowing around the world. So I almost visit every country in the whole world. I give seminars, training, and also Micromatics is recognized as university. They were certified as university. So we have PhD students, they come here, they come with us to Micromatics. They do their job. We help them to, mm, no, to get good knowledge on physics option and, and chemist option in order to characterize their catalyst and they get credits and these credits are, uh, are useful for their PhD or for your master's degree. So if you would like one day to go and have some time with us in Micromatics, you are welcome. So we're open. We have students from all over the world. I just finished with uh, one guy from Spain. He did his master's degree with me and uh, he got very good score in, in Madrid. So we are open, we are a university, and we have a, of course, a support, okay? For us, not only sell the instrument, but the support after sales. So I, gave, I will give you my, my emails here. So if any anytime you have any questions, you just have to contact us. I will be more than glad to call you by team viewer we can help or by webex or by phone any 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 things any any we have now nowadays there are so many ways to communicate so please feel free to contact us and i think my main purpose here is just to know me so you know when you call you know who simos now and i can i can support you i can give you all the support and all the help you want and if you like for example uh, once you get a report from the machine and you have any problem to make interpretation of the data, you send me the file, SMP file, so I can open it, I can see it, I can see what you have done, and I just respond to you and tell you what you have to do in order to correct what you have done the wrong way. So some people, for example, they don't know how to correct, I don't know, for surface area, okay? So I just give them some tips how to to get a good numbers and correct number for the surface area. For example, okay, many different questions on this topic. It's very nice topics, physics option and chemist option are very widely used. Everywhere you go, they use the physics option and the chemist option as a very basic technique to characterize the catalyst. I also wrote a book, of course, with a, with with a contribution for two more people who are here. Okay, so I wrote the chapter physics option and chemist option. I brought you two books. I, did not, I could not bring 20, but at least you have two copies of the books. Okay, this is not, it's not something new. It has been for 25 years now, but has all the equations you would need, okay, for physics option, uh, BT surface area, how you do language surface area, the uh, pore size distribution, all the equations. The equation will not change, okay? So the basic equations are here. So I will leave you these two books here, in just in case you need to learn a little bit more about physics option. 
And I think this, uh, I said this is uh, my name there, and you can con contact me anytime you need. All right, well, the characterizations is, this is a course, it's a one week course, okay? But I have to, I, I just, uh, Albert told me it's just one hour. So I just put here the most important uh, information about gas absorption, so the basic things. If you need more information, I'll be here for the two days. You come to me and I will explain in details what if, if you don't understand something. So we're more than happy to help. But here just, I'm gonna put it in just one hour, one half hour. So the basic things, it can go very fast. Uh, characterization of solids, I said, is a basic thing. Everyone in the university and the industries, they have to know how to use these techniques, our basic techniques. And everyone who works in catalysis has to work with this, okay? But unfortunately, many people have been in the, in the field for many years and they use them in the wrong way, okay? Um, I review many papers, okay, in applied catalysis, in general catalysis, and I see people, for example, has been working in catalysis many, many years and they report something to publish in the wrong way. For example, something very simple. When you do BT equations, you have a C value. Okay, the C value on the BT equation is very important. And nobody, nobody cares about it. And the C value, because they don't understand what the C value means. The C value includes the heat of absorption. Okay, and if you use the limits for the BT in the wrong way, you get a C value as a negative. And you're reporting 500 square meter per gram. So how can you report 500 square meter per, square meter per gram if you have a negative heat of absorption? There's no absorption, there's a repulsion. Okay, so you can tell very easy that the people, they use the BT equation, but don't understand the meaning of the parameters. This is very important. And this is what I really like to uh, teach, or like to show the people how to use, how to properly use the limits and the parameter for any equation used on the gas absorption, for physics absorption and the chemical absorption. If you have any questions during my presentation, you can stop me, I can repeat as many as you need. So that's everything has to be understood. Okay, so uh, let me see how this works, this one here. Okay, Micromix is, is just a company, has been formed 50, 57 years ago. These are the two owners of the company, Micromix. This is a professor at Georgia Tech, used to be a professor at Georgia Tech, and Clyde, uh, this is Clyde Orr, and this is Warren Hendricks, he was his student. So they started at the beginning of 1982, doing a machine for gas absorption at their uh, garage, very small one. And they started growing up, and now it's a big company, we have 220 people working on the micromatics. But they already passed away, they're dead, and we, now our president is the son of Warren Hendricks, Preston Hendricks is our president. Uh, no, sorry. Where we use the characterization of catalysts and what? For, usually it's used for heterogeneous catalysts, okay? And these things have to be, to be solid, can be characterized by physics option and chemist option. So what we do is we, so many important information we can get from the physics option. Okay, first we need to understand if you like to prepare a catalyst, we need to to characterize the support. Heterogeneous catalyst means we have two, at least two phases. One phase is a support, which is alumina or silica, as is normally is an inert solid, okay? And the other phase is the active species. For example, nickel, um, uh, platinum, depend on the reaction you're going to do, you have to select the appropriate active sites, active, active particles. So the first thing is, is we have to characterize the support. Why we need to characterize the support? And nobody does this. You just take an alumina and just prepare the catalyst, and when they try to make the test, it does not work. Why? Because the texture of the support is so important for the reaction. Textures mean surface area and porosity. Why porosity and the surface area is very important? Well, if I like to, for example, load 10% nickel over an alumina, I should have a surface. For example, if I like to put here 20 chairs, I have to have a surface to put 20 chairs. But if the surface of this, this room is very small, I cannot put 20 chairs, okay? So we need to measure surface area first. The surface area the, or the monolayer on the surface area give me an information about how much, how much active species I can load over the support, okay? This is the first thing. Surface area is very important for this. The second thing is a pore size and a pore shape. 
Okay? Remember that when you prepare your catalyst, if the active species retain or remain on the surface, it will center very fast. The activity of the catalyst will die in five minutes. Okay? What you have to do is your active species should be dispersed over the surface. Now, if the surface of the solid is very small, as I said, it's going to center very fast. Centering means that active species will, will start moving and form large particles and lose activity of the catalyst. Secondly, is that the surface area is defined in two, two ways. We have external surface area and the internal surface area. The external surface area is just on, the, on, the, on what it is on the surface, really. And the internal surface area is the most important one, is the surface area within the pores, inside the pores. So our aim, our goal in catalysis is the active species when we prepare the catalyst to go inside the pores. Okay, so we have enough surface where we can disperse the active species. Now it becomes the, not only the internal surface area, but the opening and the size of the pore in catalysis. Okay, suppose that I have a pore of this size, okay, and this is my reactant molecules, and they're larger than the opening of the pore, they cannot go. And this is in catalysis called diffusion problem. Okay, so your reactant is not going inside the pore, so you have very well dispersed active species, but you don't have access to this active species because inside, they are inside very small pore. So in order to do a reaction, we need to understand the size of the reactant, the size of the pore, okay? So the size of reactant, you will not change. You don't change because it's benzene, for example. This is, we have a fixed pore, uh, size, but the pore, you can change the size of the pore. Now, also the product is very important. Sometimes we know that the opening of the pores is very important and there's no problem with the diffusion. But what's happening when you have your reactant going inside the pore, they're going to absorb over the active species, react and diffuse out from the pore. Okay, the catalysis is a very, very fast movement. Reactant goes inside the pore, absorb, react, and goes out. But what's happening if the product is very large and can come out? It blocks the entering of the pore. The also, the, the catalyst will die very fast. Okay, the reactant goes inside the pore, react, but the product cannot come out, it blocks the pores. Okay, also the catalyst dies. So we need to understand the whole reaction, the whole process, the reactant size, the product size of the molecule, and the opening of the pore, okay? So this, this parameter is so important in catalysis, and sometimes people don't take care about them. Then they try to do the catalyst, they lose their time, they lose their, time, their money, and the, the, the catalyst will just work for a few minutes. In catalysis, in industry, we need to have the catalyst working for many, many days, maybe months, okay? So we need to fix this parameter very well, and these are fixed by this technique, the characterization by the physical absorption. Okay, so by talking on this, this is, uh, as I said, it's everything's written here. Uh, sorry. Okay. Those already, I already talked to you how important is the characterization catalysis, okay? How important it is to do the determination of surface area, the pore size, to, pre to prevent the diffusion problem. This is very important catalysis. We need to, to prevent diffusion problem. Our reactants has to diffuse very easily inside the pores and has to react, and we should have very well dispersed active species inside the pore. This is a good catalyst. What kind of solid we can, we can characterize? Any kind of solids, okay? But the solid has pores. Some of the pores has small pores. Some of them have large pores. Some of them they don't have any pores, okay? So, but any, any kind of solids we can characterize by this technique. The technique does not care about what kind of pores we have. It depends on what we will see later on, on the adsorption isotherm. This is the most important parameter in in physical absorption is the adsorption isotherm, which I will, I will take sometimes 10 or 15 minutes to explain very well. Once we understand the adsorption isotherm, we can understand everything about gas adsorption. First, we need to understand how adsorptions take place. Okay, what is causing the adsorption to take place? The adsorptions take place only if the solid has some inter intrinsic surface energy, okay? The atoms get together, okay, and they form a solid. Inside the solid, the energy, the total energy is zero, a null, zero. But the surface atoms on the surface, they have some surface energy, 
which is not compensating by, about any things because on the surface. But in nature cannot exist like this. So what they do, all solids, in order to compensate to the intrinsic surface energy, absorb water and hydrocarbon. This is why you take any kind of solids, you heat it a little bit, and you can see the water coming out. Okay? Where, where, where this water comes out is because it's absorbing to compensate to the intrinsic surface energy of the solid. So that energy could be weak or could be strong, doesn't matter, but it has to have some energy. If it's weak, the absorption is going to be very weak. If it's strong, the absorption is going to be very strong. So in this case, it's just, this is my solid here, and it's under vacuum. The first thing you have to know how to degas a sample, how to characterize, how to deactivate the solid. This is the main important thing. Please make sure you understand what I want to talk about it, because otherwise, whatever you do on your machine is going to be wrong. Okay? As I said, the solid here, in order to compensate for the surface energy, has water. Any kind of solid has water. Now, the water is inside the pores. In order to do absorption of any kind of gas, nitrogen, CO, CO2, whatever you like to have, the surface should be activated. What does mean is that you have to remove the water from the surface so that the energy will be free and can absorb the reactant molecule. The pores has water inside, and some people, the first thing, as you know, you have to do what we call degassing the sample. You degas the sample. I don't like the word degassing, okay? I like to have activation of the surface, okay? So the people they do is, to save time, they have an oven 400 degrees C and they put the sample inside. Or if the machine, you have a machine to heating, to you know, prepare samples, is you go very fast, okay? What's happening if you go very fast, the water inside the small pores will go from liquid to vapors. The volume of the vapor is almost 500 times more, okay? So what's happening if the, if the water comes in from liquid to vapor very fast, it's going to break the pores. So the small pores will be destroyed, okay? So you start with a microporous solid, I will define the very small pores, and you end with a, pore, with a, solid, with a solid having very large pores, okay? This is a big problem. And now pe people, they don't say, well, what's happening if my solid has micropores? What did happen to it? Because you destroyed it, okay? By the first step, before doing any, any absorption, any things, you destroyed your sample, okay? So please, when you like to gather a sample, go to first to a 10 degree per minute up to 80 degree and hold it for at least 10 or 15 minutes. So the, the water starts evaporating and the vacuum starts pulling the, the water very slowly, okay? 10 or 15 minutes. And after that, you can go to any temperature you want. Usually we go to the, the, the temperature at which the sample has been calcined, okay? Say for example, 500 degrees C, 400 degrees C, doesn't, does not matter too much because the water is going to to evacuate at 100 degrees C. But that step is so important to know how to degas the sample. Once we degas the sample, we recover the surface energy. Now we can do absorption, okay? So as we are talking about physical absorption, means that the, the, the heat of absorption between the reactant and the surface is very weak. If we're work, working at room temperature, the room temperature is high enough to break the bond. So there will be no absorption physical absorption, because we're working at room temperature. So what we do, we work at the liquid liquefaction temperature of the gas. If we're using nitrogen, we use liquid nitrogen. So the meaning of, or using of liquid nitrogen is to lower the temperature so we can have absorption, so that, that the temperature will be very low and does not break the bond between the, the nitrogen and the surface. This is the, the reason why we use liquid nitrogen. The second reason we use liquid nitrogen, because we would like to fill the pore with liquid nitrogen, not only gas, but with liquid nitrogen. Why? Why we like to fill the pores with liquid nitrogen? Well, see how so important it is. If I tell you I'd like to see the volume of this pore, this is a pore, okay? I'd like to see the volume of this pore. How do you do? You know, you're not going to fill it with air or with helium. You're going to fill it with liquid, right? You put the liquid, so it's liquid up to the trim, and then you take it and measure how much liquid inside, and you say, ah, this one has 25 milliliter or 50 milliliter of water. And this is the main reason why we fill the pore with liquid, okay? And in order to liquefy the gas, we need to have that, that sample at the liquefaction temperature of that gas. So we're using nitrogen, 
we use liquid nitrogen, 77K. So the nitrogen at a certain pressure start condensing and filling the pore with liquid. And then the instrument is going to give you the volume. It tells you how much volume you have in your pore. And this is your pore volume. Okay, so we see, we see the pore size, we see the surface area, and we get the pore volume. And this is very important to understand it before start preparing any kind of catalyst, otherwise you're going to fail, okay? So once we get to the point where we start absorbing, as I said, the sample is inside a burette or sample holder and inserted inside liquid nitrogen and is it empty under vacuum? The sample is under vacuum, and we start dosing small amount of gas, nitrogen in this case. What's happening is that when the, guy, the gas, this is the molecule of nitrogen, get into, inside the sample tube, the surface energy is going to attract the molecules, okay? And we will see in a few seconds, the density of these molecules of the reactant will be much higher close to the surface of the solid than here. So this is called the adsorbate, and this is adsorptive. Adsorptive means the gas or the molecule are very close and being absorbing on the surface of the solid. So this is called adsorption. Adsorption means the gas is going to move down to the surface of the solid, okay? And start interacting with the surface and start adsorbing. Now, in adsorption, there are several meanings. We can have adsorption, we can have absorption, AD or AB. Adsorption means this molecule just absorb over the surface, like this. Absorption goes inside the solid, like a sponge. If you put a sponge with water, absorb water, okay? In this case, we do not absorb, we adsorb. Means all the molecules stay on the surface of the solid. The nice thing about the adsorption is that we start absorbing layer by layer, okay? So the first layer, the second layer, the third layer, and this is very important for us, as we will see later, okay? So now, if we understand the phenomenon of adsorption, it's just a concentration toward the surface of the solid, we start, as I said, first layer, second layer, until we fill the whole pores with liquid. What we get with this? So what I'm doing is this is just to get one thing, one very important thing, and this is called adsorption isotherm. Isotherm because we, we are working at a constant temperature. Usually, we, as I said, liquid nitrogen is 77K, okay? What is adsorption isotherm? By definition, it's very easy. It's just the representation of the amount absorbed as a function of pressure, okay? This is just an adsorption isotherm. is a quantity absorbed as a function of pressure, could be absolute pressure or relative pressure, okay? Relative pressure is just the absolute pressure divided by the P0 or saturation pressure, okay? So once we get to this point, then we will know everything about the texture of the solid. Once you became ex ex expert on this, you, the, all the systems, all the instruments you, 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 you see there is from Micrometrics, from other, other company, they have about 85 pages of reports, okay? Don't go to this because you're going to get lost. Only two or three pages are very important for you. So the first page is the adsorption isotherm. So now how we, why we have a different adsorption isotherm, as we'll see now, is it's very important to understand. Why we do have a different shape of the adsorption isotherm. Now, if the, if the adsorption if the adsorption, as I said, goes layer by layer, then any kind of solid should give you the same adsorption isotherm. But as you see here, here you can see here, is you have six different adsorption isotherms. Why? Why we have different shape of adsorption isotherm? This is very important. I, I'm sure you, you understand this, but I'm going just to refresh your mind, okay? Why we get different adsorption isotherm? This is my solid. I'm gonna open like this, okay? And I have to assume something. I have to assume that that's the energy inside the, on the surface is equal in the same place, here or there or there. There's no preference of, of absorption. You come here inside the room and all the seeds are the same. So you can set one here, one there, is no preference, okay? Then we have to assume this, otherwise it becomes become very complicated. So if it's everything like this, so any kind of molecule of nitrogen is going to come here and going to absorb here or there or there, in any place, 
Okay? So we get, we get an absorption of term because we get a monolayer and we get a second layer. Now, what's happening if I change the surface of the solid? Instead like this, I'm going to close it like this. Very close. Okay? We have energy here and we have energy here. So if the, si if the distance between the walls inside the pore are very close, we have overlapping of energy. So this energy here is going to overlap with this one here. And this becomes a very, po very strong potential well of energy. Very strong. So the first molecule of nitrogen, which is going very close to the surface, is going to absorb by the small pores first. Okay? That small pores, if there are these pores smaller than 20 Armstrong or 2 nanometers, we call them micropores. Okay? So the absorption starts first with the micropore, the first small pores, due to the overlapping of the energy inside the pore. Now what's happening if I open the pore like this? I'm going to call them mesopores, between 20 and 500 Armstrong. What's happening here is the overlapping or the interaction between the energy is weaker, much weaker. So the, small, the mesopore will not start filling until we fill the micropore first. Then we start with the mesopores. And if I point like this, we call them macropores, or very large pores, larger than 500 Armstrong. This pore will fill the last. The last one to fill is the macropores. If we understood this, then it's very easy to make interpretation of the data here. Same. What's happening here? You can see the first absorption isotherm. Here, the quantity of gas absorbed. And this is the pressure. You see, the first portion of the gas at low, very low pressure is being absorbed very fast. Means the first absorption isotherm corresponds to the micropores, with solid, very small pores. Okay? You see, absorbing all the gas for very, very few, very, very little pressure, all the gas being absorbed. And once we fill all the with small pores, no absorption takes place. So we call type 1 absorption isotherm or Langwin absorption isotherm, and this corresponds to micropores. You are running your sample, you got something like that, so you know you are dealing with micropores. You're dealing with zeolite, with activated carbon, with MOFs, etc. All micropores, okay? Give you type 1 absorption isotherm. Now we get type 2 and type 4. So I'm going to compare these two, okay? So you can see this type 2 and type 4 are very similar, but they change a little bit. Type 2 and type 4, very similar. We have something here, okay? And then we have something here. So what's happening here in this case? In type 2, we get some gas absorbed here at the beginning, but start having absorption in multi-layers, first layer, second layer, and keep going, until we get a point where the pressure is almost one, relative pressure almost one, and we get something like that. It's called condensation, capillary, capillary condensation. Means the pores are being filled with liquid, but they're being filled at very high pressure. Means the pores are very large. So we're dealing with macroporous solid or non-porous materials, okay? Because there's no absorption here, but only at the end, okay? As I said, the pores are very open and only can fill at very high pressure. So therefore, if you get type 2 absorption isotherm, we're dealing with macropore solid or non-porous solids, okay? Now you can ask me, how do I know if it's macroporous solids or non-porous solids? Very easy. If we have macropores, means they have pores, the volume is high. If there's no pores, the volume is very low because the pores are going to absorb gas, and if we have pores, the quantity of gas absorbed is high. If we don't have pores, we have no absorption. The quantity will be very small, okay? But the shape will be the same. So this amount of gas absorbed is high if we have, have pores, and very small if we don't have pores. But this corresponds to non-porous materials or macroporous materials. Now you see here, type 4 absorption isotherm, you see the condensation here is, is taking place at a medium uh, uh, value of pressure, okay? So here is this more as 0.6, here almost 1. So what is that correspond to which, which kind of solids type 4 absorption isotherm? To mesoporous materials in the, in the middle, between 20 and 500 Armstrong, okay? So this is mainly 99%, or I would say 95% of the cases nowadays, all your solids correspond to the mesoporous materials or type 4 absorption isotherm, okay? Now, 
The difference also between type 4 and type 2 is that we have something here. In this case, we go up, which is called adsorption, uh, but we can go up, come down, we call desorption. So it can keep going up on the, on the pressure, keep going absorbing up, up to one, the relative pressure, but also it can desorb, decreasing the pressure. Okay, why we have this, the shape here of the screen? Is this called hysteresis? Okay, why we do have hysteresis? is very important for us, this hysteresis, okay? If we don't have any hysteresis, we have one kind of pores, and we do have hysteresis, we have different kind of pores. I will show you later, different shape of hysteresis. But we need to understand why. I'm not, in, uh, I'm not interested to just show you uh, pictures. Uh, what I'm interested for is just to understand why, why, what is causing the hysteresis. Well, what is causing the hysteresis is the following. If you have this pore here, this is a pore. It's like ink bottle pores. This is like it. When we do adsorption, we start absorbing on the, on the first layer inside the wall, the second layer, the third layer. Once the layer of gas absorb inside the pores touch each other, something happens, goes from gas into liquid. So gas from adsorption into condensation. The liquid, the gas will transform into liquid and fill the pore with liquid. This is why we see it's going very fast, exponential, the absorption. Okay? Because the gas is a very small quantity of gas, but when it's gone from gas into liquid, the volume will be much smaller. So we have to fill all the pores and we'll fill the pore with liquid. Now we, st we went to almost one to re relative pressure and all the pores are filled with liquid up to the, to the, to the tip here. Okay? But when we do desorption, okay, it's something different. Because now the, the desorption is going to con be controlled by the opening of the pore. Okay? Now we need to take the liquid from here. So now we have a meniscus like this on the, on the top. So when we start desorbing, where we are decreasing the pressure, the meniscus go from here to flat, to open like this, and then we get to a point where we break the meniscus and all the liquid comes out. Okay? So this is why it's not that easy to take the, the liquid out from the pores, and therefore we, we, we find it like we have hysteresis. You can see here as we, I'm decreasing the pressure down, and nothing's happening. It's just the meniscus is changing from concave to, to be flat and to convex, and we break it. And once it breaks, all the liquid comes out. Okay? So that hysteresis is very important for us in catalysis. Okay? Why? Because if the hysteresis, the larger the hysteresis, the larger the, the, the difference between the opening of the pore and the cavity of the pore. Okay? So if I have the cavity of the pore, the opening of the, of the pore very small and the cavity very large, I'm going to have very large hysteresis. Is this very, impo sorry, very important here, the difference between this one and this one. But if I don't have any hysteresis, why? Because I will have a very cylindrical pores. So the opening and the cavity is the same. So there was no hysteresis. So you can see now, by looking to hysteresis, I can tell what kind or what, what shape of pores I do have in my solid. It's very important to understand the hysteresis, okay? Type 3 and type 5 now are very similar again. See, you can see it's very similar. But they are very different to type 2 and type 4. Why? You can see here we have some absorption, but here we don't have any absorption at the beginning. So what you have here, you have a C value, negative C value, you have a repulsion. You don't have any adsorption. So nitrogen gets into the surface. Sometimes we have, for example, OH group on the surface. And OH group are charged with negative charge. And nitrogen has a pair of electrons, also have a negative charge. So get to the surface and have a repulsion, does not absorb. But if we keep going on the pressure, we get to a point, we go from nothing absorb into liquid directly. So the pressure is so high, we just fill the pores with liquid. So this is what, if you get something like that, you will not be able to measure surface area. Okay, I will show you later on. What we do in this case, we change the adsorbate. If the nitrogen is causing the problem because a pair of electron, here we change from nitrogen to argon. Here where the people change, and see why we use argon, is because you have C value negative, and you get type three or type four adsorption at the term, and we need to have adsorption because the surface area is measured here, okay? So here we don't have any, any monolayer or any multilayer absorption, so we need to change the adsorbate from nitrogen into argon. But, the, but the, 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 the similarity between this and this is just have hysteresis, and this also has mesopores materials, 
because the condensations take place at the intermediate pressure. And this one is like this, has a macroporous material, but has a negative absorption because it has OH group or any negative charge on the surface of the solid. Is this clear? Is this very important? This, this is to be understood. If you have any question, please, now is the time to ask, and we're more than happy to repeat. <coughs> no questions? Yes, okay. Uh, question. uh, with respect to the type 3, uh -huh. if, if I have the isotherm at type 3, you said I have to change the isotherm gas to argon. What about the temperature? We, you can, close to yeah, <coughs> very important question. Argon, we can use argon up to 0 0.6 relative pressure if you're using liquid nitrogen, okay? Liquid nitrogen is 77K, and liquid argon is 87K. If you use argon, uh, argon at liquid nitrogen, once you get to 0 0.6 relative pressure, the argon starts snowing inside, it forms snow. It just goes in, does not form any liquid, but starts forming solid inside the pore. So we need to avoid it, we need to have a liquid. You can use uh, argon, and liquid nitrogen because 0 0.6 is here. So you get the multilayer. So you can measure surface area without any problem. But what you cannot measure is a total pore volume because we don't have liquid, but we have ice. In this case, if you like to use argon and get that total absorption as a term, you have to use liquid argon. In my states, in our case, we, liquid argon is cheaper than liquid nitrogen. It's something strange, but it is cheaper. It is about $50 less in the big tank liquid argon to liquid nitrogen, okay? And I'm going to show you later on, this is liquid argon, and argon is very important nowadays. Nobody uses nitrogen. We microwaves, we have a lab, very large lab. We measure mm, samples and the charge for measuring sample over there. And for gas absorption, we, we use very few nitrogen, okay? Because all the micropores we will have a problem when we use nitrogen for the micropores because of the diffusion problem. So we use argon, okay? So we have no problem with argon, and this is, we can find it very easily. But the good thing about it is that if you have, for example, a triflex, okay, as we have here, you can use, if you have something like that, I would like to measure micropores, you can use the micropores port with argon at liquid nitrogen, and you get to 0 0.6, you can the micropores distribution, as we'll show you later, and the surface area. And for total pore volume, you can use nitrogen on the same sample. You have three sample, three pores on the, on the three flex. I get the same sample, I measure the argon for the micropores, and measure nitrogen for the mesopores, okay? So the system can run three samples at the same time, okay? So you can use it for the same, so same liquid nitrogen, you can use argon on one side, and you can use nit nitrogen on the other side. The nitrogen, oh, nowadays, because nitrogen has a mm, deep polar moments, okay, has two electrons there, can interact with the surface of the solid very strongly. What can cause, if you have this, you will have a shift on the micropores. As I said, the micropores have very, very strong energy inside the pores. And the nitrogen has also some energy is not so inert like the argon, then we have a strong energy. We have very strong energy and we don't have a physisorption. We have pseudo chemisorption. So what's happening if you're measuring micropore, micropores and you expect to have four Armstrong in your solid, you're gonna get six or eight, it's gonna shift, okay? So it does not give you the correct number, or the correct size of micropores if you use nitrogen for the micropores. So nobody now, for example, in the United States and all the publications nowadays, they use argon for the micropores and not nitrogen, okay? But the nitrogen is being used for the total pore volume, we have no problem, okay? Once you get after the micropores, the nitrogen works very well, okay? But this is a good question, thank you. Okay, once we get to this point here, we get six, number six for uh, absorption isotherm. As you can see here, it's a homogeneous solid with absorption here layer by layer. The first layer, second layer, third layer, but it's very rare, okay? It's more synthetic solids. It's maybe one per thousand. You get type six absorption isotherm. What you get normally nowadays is type one absorption isotherm for all zeolites or activated carbon or MOFs materials, which is microporous material, give type 1 absorption isotherm, and the rest of them they get type 4 absorption isotherm. Usually, is this what you get? Okay, this is one example of the, from the triflex, okay, the system you have here, is two zeolite, 13 X zeolite and Y zeolite. It's very important when you present the absorption isotherm to present the logarithmic one. 
okay not the linear one i'll show you now with an example if you if you have just the, the linear one you'll get confused okay you're expecting a difference between the micropores between teozeolite but the adsorption acetone gives you the same information but if you do logarithmic you can get something like this what is what we can get from this one here is this, that 13 x light the adsorption is taking place at lower pressure means it has smaller pore than the y zeolite okay the smallest the, the lower the relative pressure the higher will be the amount of micropores in your solid. So this is more micropore than this. Both of them are micropores, but this one has smaller pore than this one here. Once you get to a certain point here, they have the same volume almost, and then you have condensation on the surface, but this is not, is not critical for, for a zeolite. But you can get here the total pore volume, but what you get here is a distribution of the micropores and the 13 x zeolite are smaller pores than the white zeolite. So usually when you get the adsorption at the just ask for the logarithmic uh, <coughs> presentation and not the linear presentation. Yes, sir? If you intend to publish these results, do they accept the logarithmic? Should be like this. <coughs> okay? We are used to that. Yeah, uh, nowadays, uh, then because you get, you'll see now you get confused. Because if, I, if I'm your referee, okay, I'm reading your paper, I cannot see. Okay, you're telling me, you're telling me, okay, I have 13 x light, it's more micro blah, blah, but I don't see it, okay? So I know, because of my experience, I know that 13 x light is more micro than than another one, but you cannot see it on the adsorption isotherm. You are not seeing it in terms of micro but not in terms of surface area, since they seem to have very close surface area. We're talking about micro pores. Surface area is similar, because I can tell from here, yeah. okay? But about the micro pores, it's different. Okay, so I need to show is it your referee? You see, when you publish a paper, you need to make sure that your referee accepts your paper the first time. Otherwise, gonna send it to you back. Okay, um, unfortunately, I work I work on this many many years. I have many papers to read, and sometimes it's uh, something like that. What the referee wants to do is just to make sure they understand. Okay, it's not because he, he, they want to refuse you. It's just to make sure that you understand what you're talking about. Okay, so in this case here. You're telling him that 13 x light is a more micropore than, than the y light Has no questions, because you can see it from here, okay? It's very important questions. Okay, this, for example, this is a linear one, okay? But this is a mesoporous material, micropores materials. This is like, for example, silica 100 nanometers in micropores, 1,000 Armstrong, okay? As you can see here, is a, this is from the reflex. You can see here is a very small amount of gas. And then you have condensation at very large, very high rate of pressure to one. So we can tell this one here is a micro-porous materials or non-porous materials. Very fast from the adsorption isotherm. This one I goes, this is a nitrogen or magnesium sterate. Also, this is type three adsorption isotherm because there's no adsorption at the beginning. You can see here. So this, this is a real examples. So only have condensation at very high pressure, but there's no adsorption at the beginning. Okay, now we'll start to measure surface area, okay? Surface area is this, what we need to understand for surface area is the amount of gas necessary to cover the first layer on the, on the surface of the solid. This is nitrogen, I give you 1,000 molecules of nitrogen, and we'd like to see the measure the surface area of this table. What you do, you take nitrogen, you still having one beside one, and you fill the whole surface with this, with this uh, 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 nitrogen molecules, okay? If you know how many molecules of nitrogen were necessary to measure to, to cover the surface area, and you know the area for which each one of the molecules, you can multiply the number of molecules by the area of each one of them, and you get the surface area, right? Very easy. Exactly what we do here. The same thing. We measure the amount of nitrogen which is necessary to cover the first layer over the solid. We know the area of one molecule of nitrogen, we multiply the number of molecules of nitrogen by the area of each one, and we get the surface area. Exactly the same thing, okay? So, well, this is just an example, and I'd like to see now adsorption. And during the adsorption, we have adsorption and we have desorption. So one molecule adsorbs, another molecule desorbs. Once we get into equilibrium, the number of molecules of nitrogen was hitting the surface is exactly the same number of molecules dissolving from the surface. So we get the adsorption, condensation is adsorption, okay, evaporation, which is desorption. At the equilibrium, we have this and this equal, so we get into this equation. 
So this is the energy. This is how we calculate the surface area. We we'll start with this, okay? We get to these numbers here, and then we can go and measure the single point surface area. So what we are interesting for is this: from the adsorption isotherm, we get the number of moles adsorbed, or number of milliliters per gram, whatever you like, okay? So n is number of moles, and n sub m is the number of moles necessary to cover the monolayer on the surface, okay? n divided by n sub m equal theta. Theta is the coverage on the surface. So what we do is if you, we organize everything with the first one reaction, we get to these equations here. n divided by n sub m, number of moles absorbed as a uh, divided by the, the number of moles of the monolayer, is a function of the pressure and a constant. And that constant, as I said before, contains the heat of absorption. So it's very important to measure, and when you prepare a, pa a paper and you like to publish a paper and show your, your uh, re uh, referee, yeah, you know what you're talking about, just give him the number, the, the number of B, and should be positive, okay? Should be positive. Don't make this mistake to, sh to show your referee with a B negative value. It's going to just refuse your paper, okay? Because it's heat of absorption, and if we are talking about heat of absorption, means that the heat of absorption is positive, okay? So from this, it's just, just an example, top one absorption isotherm. We can very easily, we can calculate at any given pressure, we can calculate the amount of gas absorbed. But we are interested about the number of moles on a monolayer and not the number of moles absorbed in total. Because I said we have first layer, second layer, third layer. But I need to understand the first layer. So the Langmuir equation as well as the BT equation just give you the number of moles of gas absorbed on a monolayer from the total amount of gas absorbed. This is, the, this is, the, this is all about these equations, okay? It's to measure the amount of gas on the monolayer from the total amount of gas absorbed. So this is the first layer, the, fir the, the first equation, the Lemire equation. If we would, it's just reorganizing the, the equation. P is the pressure at which absorption takes place as a function of n, n is the number of moles. So at any, any given pressure, I have a amount of gas absorbed. It's a function of one divided B n sub m, and those is very important. B is the heat of absorption, n sub m is a monolayer, plus P over n. So from this one here, we have the slope, okay? So what you do is this versus P versus pressure, I, you have to get a straight line, okay? If you don't get a straight line, it's because you are not in equilibrium. Everything has to be in equilibrium. Why? Because the equation absorption and desorption should be in equilibrium, should be equal to zero, right? Then, if you are in equilibrium, you should get a straight line. Now, what is the limit? This is what you have to understand. When we have to start and when we have to finish with the, these equations, okay? The limits is that at the first absorption term, one thing which I have to mention to you, <coughs> Sorry, any re inflection point on the absorption isotherm means something. Okay, you have absorption isotherm like this and like this. So you have two inflection points. Okay, the first inflection point is telling you that you are starting to finish the first layer and start to absorb in the multi-layer, second layer, third layer, and fourth layer, until you get for the second inflection point. The second inflection point is telling you that you have something's happening. What's happening is that from the absorption in the multilayer, we are going from gas into liquid. And this is what we call capillary condensation or the liquid inside the pore. Okay? So in this case, is this is the first point on the absorption, any absorption as a term, you take the first point, okay, when the first inflection point, and the last point. And usually they are between 0 0.05 and 0 0.3. Okay? Later on I'll show you why 0 0.3. Okay? But it's, I will explain to you later on. Okay, for dense once we get n sub m from that equation, okay, from the slope, n sub m is the number of moles on the monolayer. Then I would like to know the number of molecules. That's fine, because I can divide it by the volume absorbed by 22414 milliliter per mole. I get the number of moles, right? And the number of moles in, in standard conditions has 6.23 molecules of nitrogen, 10 to the 23. This is Avogadro number. So if this is if you, have a, so if you have the number of moles, sorry, I'm used to this, number of moles, you can multiply by the number of molecules, so you know how many molecules were necessary to cover the surface area. Then you multiply by sigma, is the area of one molecule of nitrogen, and you get the surface area, okay? 
So if you get a surface area, you have to divide by the mass, sample mass, to get a specific surface area. So you compare your result here in China, in your states, whatever you like. Okay? So you divide by the mass. But the mass should be dry after degassing, okay? because the sample can lose about 10% weight because of the water. Okay? So after degassing, you take the sample, or after analysis, you take the sample, you weigh the sample, and you enter the sample weight, and you get the specific surface area. Okay? Okay, this is two, two absorption isotherm. Okay, you can see here the difference between two type two and type four. Very easy. Type two is condensation at high pressure, and type two at intermediate pressure. All right. So the BT equation now. The first one was a Langmuir equation, which we apply for the type one absorption isotherm only. Okay, type one absorption isotherm. You apply the first equation, Langmuir equation, and you get the surface area. Now, if you go to BT, what's the difference between the BT and the Langmuir? Okay. The Langmuir, suppose a type 1 absorption isotherm, only have one layer on the surface. Okay? Only one layer. This is what you get like this. Okay? Absorb the micropore and nothing else. So I have one layer of absorption. Langmuir died thinking that it's all, all the solids will behave the same way, have only one layer of gas. Later on, BT, Brauer, Brunauer, Emmett, E. Teller, this BT, they said, okay, let's see if Langmuir was right. And they took by accident, they took a silica, okay? A silica does not have micropores. And they saw it's a difference. So we have absorption multi-layer. Said, okay, now we don't have one layer. So Langmuir equation does not apply for solid having more pores or larger pores than micropores. So any solid has more micro, not only a micropore, a mesopore, a micropore, you cannot apply the type of absorption isotherm. You cannot apply the Langmuir equation, okay? So what they did is just, okay, they said, if Langmuir says n or the number of layers is 1, let's take it infinite, 2, 3, or 4, 5. So they changed the Langmuir equation a little bit, and it came with a BT equation to measure the surface area for multi -point, for uh, different pore size, what we call the mesopore uh, solids. So what we did is just the first thing is that's very easy. Okay, so okay, between 0 0.05 and 0 0.3, we take this point, and let's assume the number of layers is more than 1. Okay, and they wrote this famous equation. This is a very famous equation for the for the for the BT equation, but it's the same. We have the pressure, we have the volume absorbed, and we have this ca this ca this uh, constant, which includes the heat of absorption. Okay, the same thing here. For example, you have V sub m instead to be number of moles is the volume. Remember, I can I can go from volume into moles by dividing by two two four one four. Very easy. Okay, so we can get the same thing as before. And we can measure the surface area for, for type 2 and type 4 absorption isotherm. So exactly the same thing is in this case here we have the we arrange this equation, we have this these numbers here. We know the pressure, we know the volume as a function of relative pressure. You also have to get a straight line equation straight line. If you don't get a straight line, you are not in equilibrium. Sometimes I've seen some papers to be published and point like this. Okay? Point like this means you don't have equilibrium, then nobody knows what the real surface area is. Okay? So you need to go and uh, you need to equilibrate. How we do equilibrate? We just wait a longer time. Okay? When we don't have equilibrium, when we have tortuous pores, inter interconnecting pores, you have a pore like this, another pore like this, another pore like this. So that just takes some time to diffuse and go inside all the pores. Okay? So you need to wait longer time for equilibrium. So your system will ask you for equilibrium time, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, is up to you. Normally for mesoporous materials, we take about 15 seconds equilibrium time. The default of the system is five seconds. Five seconds is too, too short. Okay? So when you, when you set up the, 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 the file for analysis, just make sure you put 15 seconds for mesoporous materials and 45 seconds for microporous materials. Longer time because more pores, we have more diffusion problem. Okay, so once we get to this point here, it's very easy. Once we get something like that, straight line from the slope and the intercept here, we can measure the n number of moles or number of volume of the monolayers. And once we get the volume of monolayer, it's very easy. We can measure surface area as before. So what you get here is just this. Okay, we measure the slope and the intercept because the V sub m or the monolayer is one divided should have it somewhere here. One divided by V sub m, one divided by the slope, and from it we can measure the surface area. V sub m, one divided by slope plus intercept. So then you have the, the slope and the intercept, and you get V sub m, the monolayer. 
Okay, the whole one layers, then I can get the surface area. Here I'm showing you is the value of C. Okay, if you get C value one or two, you can see here you got type three adsorption isotherm, so you cannot report the surface area. You have to get at least 100 at least. C value 100 means that the gas is being absorbed by the sample. Otherwise, it's being repulsion by the sample. It's not absorbing. <coughs> Yes, because is type one absorption isotherm, right? And Langmuir is n equal one, so it's number one is one. Okay. Now some people, I was going to to go a little bit further, apply the bit equation for the micropore solid. Okay. Then you get the trouble. This is where the pro trouble is. Okay. This is what I need to teach in the people, and I call them when I read the paper something like that in, in order to refuse the paper. I don't like to refuse a paper like this. I just call the, the professors, okay? Their professors, usually they're PhD students, okay? What's happening is that says if you're applying the beat equation for a microporous solid, what's happening if you look to this equation, this equation, the pressure is going up. You, is, we have type one absorption isotherm. Okay, here is have condensation like this. But for type one absorption isotherm, if I go back to, it's very important, very important to understand this. This one here. You see, n equal one. If you apply the BT equation, you're applying the pressure is going up, but the volume is constant, it's not changing. And if you do this, you get very large slope, okay? Remember that V7 is one divided by the slope. You get very large slope. So your intercept will be negative, okay? If your intercept is negative, the C value is negative, okay? For example, you're, you're measuring surface area for zeolite, okay? You apply the BT equation you get 500 square meter per gram, but your zeolite may be 900 square meter per gram. Because one divided by something very large and very small, right? Your slope is very high, okay? One divided by the slope is very, very, because the slope is very high, is very small. And if V sub M is very small, your surface area is very small, okay? So you have to be very careful when you apply the BD equation for type one absorption at term. If your C value is negative, you cannot use it. But I can give you some, some, something to do in order to justify why we use BT equation. If you expand this, as we did in this case here, if you expand it, okay, then here where the volume is constant, but here is not constant. So instead to go the limits between 0 0.05 and 0 0.3 for the BT equation, you go from 0 0.05 and down, 0 0.05 to 0 0.04, 0 0.03. Until you, you apply 0 0.04, your, your system that reflects here, you just see it on the, on the screen. You change it to lower until the C value becomes positive. And you will see the surface area go from 500 to 900 square meter per gram. Okay? I have uh, sometimes, in maybe 10 years ago, there are two big large companies, I'm not going to mention their names, they have the same solid as we're fighting because in one place they get 900, another place they get 500, and they're working together, and they don't know why. Okay? Because many, many, many places, I'm not saying here, okay, many places the professor don't look into detail. The professors, they would like to see numbers, okay, 500, 600, but they don't look at the details. And the details is very important. If the technician, whoever did the, result, the, the analysis, did not take care of this, the numbers are very, completely wrong. And you get the number 500, and now oh, I'm expecting 1,000. How you get 500? It's because you used the, the PET equation limits in the wrong way, okay? Using this machine, I've analyzed the mock that has the high surface area, mm -hmm. 1,700 meters square per mm -hmm. The report shows me the BAT surface area and the Langmuir. Mm -hmm. The isotherm curve was 5.1. Mm -hmm. The difference between the BAT and the Langmuir was around 100 meters square per So is it critical in this case, this difference between Langmuir and BAT? Uh, well, depends on this. Is, uh, if you accept 100 difference, 100 square meter per gram difference is okay. But if you, you adjust the BT equation limits back, you should get the same numbers. It should be very close, within 5% or 2%. Okay? But sometimes you get much bigger, larger difference. Okay? So it depends on the, on the, on the adsorption isotherm. And especially with that you have, you, are, you are dealing with a bimodal distribution. Bimodal distribution, you have micropores, I have mesopores. Okay, and if the contribution for the micropores are larger than mesopores, you get C value negative. So you have to adjust your BAT limits. 
Okay? So it gets critical when you get this, 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 the, the contribution for the micro pores. Okay, let's go back where we are. Okay, uh, how are we going on the times? Okay? Yeah, we still come back. We still come back. Hmm? We have till 10.15. Pardon me? We have till 10.15. Okay, what time is it now? 10.15. It's finished? No, 10.50. Ah, 10.50. Okay. Okay, then there's 30 more minutes and we'll finish everything, okay? So let's go bit faster than that. Now we measure the surface area, how we know, we know exactly how to do it. Now we go to the second thing, we measure the pore size, okay? Not only the surface area, but the pore size. But in order to get a pore size, we need to have a liquid inside the pores, okay? So we use different equations, the Kelvin equation, and this is a famous, very famous equation, which is RK, is a function of also the pressure, okay? Because everything is constant. Okay, cosine theta is zero, and this is sigma, and V sub m, RT uh, is uh, the concept of, uh, of the gas, and T is the temperature of the analysis. So everything is constant. So RK, the radio of Kelvin, is a conversion function of relative pressure. So at any given relative pressure, I can measure RK. But RK is not the size of the pore, okay? RK, the Kelvin equation is from here, this is RK, from here to here. But when you start absorbing inside the pore, you get some, some layer before the condensation takes place. I said you have first layer, second layer, enter the layer, touch each other, then you have condensation, okay? So ra ra Kelvin radius is failing to measure the size of the pore. It's just measuring from here to here. It's smaller than the size of the pore, okay? So what you have to do is, is we have to correct for it in order to get the RP. So RK is this, you can see that everything is constant and the function of pressure. So I can measure RK. Now I can measure the, the, the size of the pore, I use another equation, okay, with T, called T, is a thickness in English, thickness, and to measure how many layers were pre-absorbed before condensation, okay? And the T thickness is equal, 3.54 is the diameter of one molecule of nitrogen, okay, because we are using one nitrogen, five is a constant, and also the pressure. So it's the same pressure as the side of the radio of Kelvin. So I measure the radio of Kelvin, I measure a T, and add them together. RK plus T equal RP. See, okay, so we can correct the size of the pore by measuring the Kelvin radius and measuring the T value and adding together, and we get the size of the pore. Okay, well, this is, I'm going faster because it's just showing you in more details. Okay, this is an example. Okay, this is what you get. You get the absorption isotherm, absorption and desorption, and you get the first derivative of the absorption isotherm, okay? And this tells you the volume of the pore and the size of the pore, okay? We call it the distribution of the volume as, as a function of the size of the pore. My, many, some people call it the uh, pore size distribution. It's not pore size distribution, it's distribution of the volume as a function of the size. Okay, this is the correct definition of this curve. This is the hysteresis. It's very important for us, as I said, the hysteresis gives you the shape of the pore, okay? If the pores are cylindrical, as I said before, like this, the hysteresis is very small, okay? H1 is so very, very small, no hysteresis. But if something like that, you get very large hysteresis. So the larger the difference between the, the opening of the pore and the cavity, the larger will be the hysteresis. Or it could be like this, layer by layer, okay? H3, H4. Is this one layer, second layer? It's like carbon, activated carbon, okay? Activated carbon is very typical. You get something like that. So you know it's this, it's this, uh, a slit-shaped pores, okay? But this is what you get normally, this or this. It's between, the, between the, the atoms or this is the shape of the pore like this and we get very large hysteresis. As I said, the hysteresis is going to give you information about the diffusion. If you get very large hysteresis, then you know that this your reaction is going to be very slow, okay? Because a catalysis is a diffusion phenomena. So you have to have the reactant going inside the pore and if the diffusion is very slow, the reaction is also very, very slow. Okay, the last one is this total pore volume. At the end of the absorption isotherm, where all the pores are filled with liquid, then we can take the volume here and we come here. Remember that your system only measures gas, okay? It does a small amount of, no amount of gas into the sample and measures the, at the end how much left. It does not measure the amount of gas absorbed. It said, I'm doing this much, and at the, after equilibrium, I'm getting this. The difference what it is, absorbed by the sample, okay? So at the beginning, we have everything here, the amount of gas, 
So this is the amount of gas, but I need to know the liquid inside the pore. It will use the Gervitz rules. It was we transform the gas into liquid by multiplying the factor of conversion of density between gas and liquid, and we get the number of moles in liquid, and this is my total pore volume. This is why it's so important because when you like to prepare your catalyst, okay, you take the total pore volume of your support and make the solution of it in a way that says all the solution will go inside the pore. So when you, because if you have excess of liquid, some of the, uh, the metals or oxide or, or salt of there is going to remain on the liquid. You like to get everything inside the pore, so you use the total pore volume, may, maybe a little bit more. But this is what you do in your solution of the salt, and psh, you put it over the, the support, and all the solution will go inside the pore. Then you dry it, and you calcine it, and all the metal will remain inside the pore. Okay. This is an example which is taken from one, one of my, my presentation. It just, I get the MCM41. MCM41 is a very known solid, is a mesoporous solid, okay? Then I did the adsorption and desorption isotherm. This is the shape, this as you see here, is a mesoporous solid. And then I, I took it, I impregnated it with 10%, just, just to show the people, is cobalt oxide, okay? In the good catalyst, you get, when, you, when you finish, you, do, you get like this, okay? If I got the same adsorption isotherm, it's a big problem. Mean all the cobalt remain on the surface, did not go inside the pores. And then you have very very large chunk on the surface, and means that says you have very large particles and all the active particles are inside these large particles, and they are not accessible for the reaction. In catalysis, we need to have very well dispersed active species so that we have a good uh, interaction between the reactant molecule and the surface. But if you have very large particles, like sintering, you have very, very large number of particles inside the large particles. Only the surface of large particles is accessible to the reaction. Okay? So in this case, it's telling me that all the cobalt went inside the pore. Okay? Unfortunately, I don't have the other example where it's very bad. You do this and you get exactly the same as ocean isotherm, means that all your metals remain on the surface. And by looking by the electron microscope, you see chunk like this on the surface. Okay? So it's bad catalyst. So I, before doing um, any reaction, I do this, so I know my catalyst is good. At least I have all my active species are inside the pore. There's something else to study with chemistry option, we'll see you tomorrow. But at least the first impression, I have all my oxide are inside the pores. Okay, as so an example, this is white zeolite. Okay, it's a different zeolite, which is we have uh, X and Y zeolite. You can say very similar here. So they have very small, very s the same uh, volume of zord. But when you go to the, well, it's not fair. It says, you see what the example is, that if you show like this, you have no difference. Well, this is the same thing as we showed before on the logarithmic. So if you report this, your referee, you can say, well, okay, you're telling me this is why zoolite is more, uh, more a micropore than one, but how do you show this? Okay? You need, for your referee, I said I have 35 years experience on this, and I talk to many referees, because when they, they give you a paper, they for four or five. And the referees, we talk to each other, okay, to see why they did this, if the, the, the students really understand or not. It's going to ask you, how do you know if this is a micropore? Which one is my, more micropore than another one? In this case, no way. So it's very important to show the, the logarithmic uh, uh, adsorption isotherm. Okay, the T value is very important also not only to measure the size of the pore, to correct for the size of the Kelvin, but also to when you have a bimodal distribution. Okay, if I have a bimodal distribution, I need to know what is the contribution to my solid from the micropore and from mesopores. Okay, so I do a T plot analysis. The T plot also comes from the thickness. Is this, is this very simple equation like this? Now, if I have micropore solid, I will get this. And the extrapolation to zero, this is my micropore volume. If I don't have micropores, it will go directly to zero. Okay? There's no micropores in my sample. What is important is that you like to know the micropore volume, the total pore volume, the mesopore volume the micropore area, the total area, okay? So how do we know this? As I said, here you have total pore volume I show you at the end of the adsorption isotherm. This is a total pore volume. From the T value, okay, I get the micropore volume. From the slope of this, 
I get the external surface area. This is how you're gonna you're gonna make interpretation of the data when you go to, when you get to a report from the system. The system is not going to tell you anything. Okay, you're gonna do the t plot analysis, and you are going going to do the interpretation. Okay, from the slope, you get the external surface area. What does mean the external surface area? The system does not tell you what the external surface area is. The external surface area is the area of any kind of pore above micropores. Okay, anything above micropore we call the external surface area. But I would like to know what is a micropore uh, surface area. We cannot measure micropore surface area because we don't. We are not sure about the monolayer inside the micropore. Very small pore. Maybe one molecule of nitrogen is touching both. Okay, what we assume or what we accept normally is a BT equation is a total surface area. Okay. The T plot from the slope is external surface area, and the difference is the micropore surface area. So how do, how this is the way how we make interpretation, how we get the different surface area. All right. Well, this is uh, just an example about the MCM forty one. MCM forty one maybe twenty five years ago, the people thought it was a micropore solid. Okay, because usually any solid will give you higher than five hundred square meter per gram. People said we have micropores. Okay, because a micropore makes a lot of contribution to the surface area. Okay, because very small, you have a lot of area. But MCM forty one is, is, is exemption. Okay, because it has five hundred square meter per gram, but it's not a micropore. How do we know this? By the t-plot analysis. We did the t-plot analysis, and we found out that the t-plot analysis go to zero, means there's no micropores. And because of the pores are about 28 to 30 or 40 Armstrong, okay? And the micropores are about 20 Armstrong. It's so very small to be a micropore, but it's not a micropore. It's a mesoporous solid. Okay, see, so for example, if we do the t-plot analysis, you go to zero, okay? So it is, it is also is a micropore solid, but we can get that the contribution of the total pore and the micropore solids here is very small. This one, for example, the tip for effluent clearing catalyst, FCC catalyst, is a micropore solid. Okay, so this is what you do for the tip plot analysis. So we take these points here and we take the tip plot analysis. See, the tip plot analysis is very similar to the adsorption isotherm. It's just we have the volume absorbed as a function of T instead of function of relative pressure. The adsorption isotherm was amount of gas absorbed as a function of relative pressure. Here in this case, we have amount of gas absorbed as a function of T. Okay, and the T, as I said, is, is I gave you a different equation to measure T, and you get extrapolation. If you have a micropore volume, this is your micropore volume. If we do, did not have any micropore volume, this will go directly to zero. Okay, so very easy to know if it's a micropore or not, and give you the amount of micropore volume and the external surface area. Okay. This is a very different equation of T. You can, people in Holland, for example, they would use one T, another, but I have a, an example where all the T's give you very similar, within one or two percent. But you can, you can select, the, the, on the software that exists, you, you select the one you want, but it will not change too much your value. Classic pore size distribution, I just show you, is, is, this is a macro pore symmetry, I'm not going to talk about this. If we do have a macro pore solid, we cannot use the nitrogen absorption, because once you get to 0 0.95, you start having a problem on the, uh, on the pressure transducer. Small change on the pressure, 0.001 relative pressure, give a large, large change on the pore, pore size. So we cannot use nitrogen for, liquid ni for uh, pore size, but we use mercury porcimity at different techniques. This is the limitation, okay, the Washburn equation for the total pore volume, the Kelvin equation, and non-local density function theory. This is also a course which is about five hours at least, okay? Nowadays, people, they don't use the Kelvin equation. They use a non-local density function theory. Why? This is, we developed this at Micromatics maybe 10 years ago, because if you have a micropores, you cannot use the Kelvin equation because I said Kelvin equation should have condensation inside the pores. For the micropores, we don't have condensation. So you cannot apply the Kelvin equation. Then you need to use, for example, a different equation, which is, uh, uh, I, wish I just named them here. But then you get for micropore one distribution and for mesopore another distribution. And people don't like this. For ASTM, we have a very critical. I said, why we have to have two different equations for the same solid? Okay, so we came for DFT, density function theory, or non-local density function theory. It's very simple. 
but it's very complicated to, to, to do the calculation, okay? Because it takes 1,000 adsorption isotherm from the same adsorption isotherm. What does mean is that we take a range of 0.5 in the adsorption isotherm and we, we simulate the adsorption. And we make simulation and compare with the real adsorption isotherm. If that does exist, the same volume, then the pore exists. If not, it doesn't exist. And we do 1,000 calculations. So the computer should be very strong, otherwise it starts getting fumes, it starts just burning, okay? Because it does not calculate this. So nowadays, all the computers are very, very strong. But you have it in your system, okay? Come to your system. And learn how to do the DFT and non-local density function theory if you have micropore and mesopore. If you have mesopore, you can ni use nitrogen because everybody can understand the nitrogen, how it works very easy. Non-local density function theory and density function theory change a little bit, okay? I just, I'm not going to, sh to show you all the, uh, all the calculation, but that is the equation. But the main difference is that density function theory, as it says this, is a density of liquid, okay? At, at any given relative pressure. We know the nitrogen, we know the pressure, we know the density, and from the density we measure the size of the pore. Okay, this is density function theory. But for the density function theory, in order to be simplifying the calculation, we assume that the electrons are still inside the pore, that they don't move, okay? We represented this paper many times, and one time we were in, in uh, in big congress, and Catalyst congress, we presented this paper and my people went against us. No, we cannot do this. We cannot assume that the electrons are still inside the pores. They're moving, okay? So we came back to micromedics. We learned from our customer, from congresses. We call the congresses, make presentation, and the people give us some, some idea, okay? There are some people, very important people in the congress, and they came against me and said, no, you cannot say that the, the electron is just still inside, doesn't move inside the, inside the pore. It's moving all the time, okay? So it took us three years later, some calculation and assumption, and we gave was a non-local density function theory. So the electron is moving everywhere, okay? And this gave us much better result. So in your system, you have a density function theory and non-local density function theory, okay? But it's the same is to measure the pore size. Example, HK, okay, is, is uh, an example for the micropores distribution. You can see here, say the micropore distribution, about six Armstrong. Classical DSM-5, non-local density function theory. And what I did here, I changed the, the relations, the ratio between silica and alumina, okay? The alumina is more micropores than the silica. As, I, as, you, can, as you change the ratio between silica and alumina, and you start creating mesopores. So very easy with non-local density function theory. I can see the, the, the shift on the size of the pore. Well, this reflex is, I think, uh, we'll talk about later. Okay, is, is I will show you inside and where the instrument is. Okay, the nice thing about the three flex is that you have three different stations and you can use any, any adsorbate. There's no limits, okay? You can see all of them here. And once you click on this, all the parameters comes automatically. You don't have to make any calculation. Make it very easy to our customer. Just click on the one you want and all the parameters for the si size of the molecule and the, the, everything is inside. So you don't have to do anything. This is examples, you see how, how nice it is. This is vapors, okay, benzene, butanol, and water. So you can use also vapors, not only liquid. I have a lot of examples as uh, we've been working with this about 10 years and we did the uh, results using any kind of adsorbate. Okay, you say the system is, is heated, so there's no condensation, you have conditions for the vapor, so you can use any kind of adsorption. Okay, you have, for example, here in the zeolite, ZSM5 and Fauger site, and you can see the difference between them. Okay, how nice it is, see? But it is a logarithmic thing. If I don't do logarithmic, you, you don't see it. Okay, argon, I already explained to you, I'm not going to repeat, is we use argon for micropores, and I, I told you why, okay? Just more examples. Okay, for in, in if you don't have very sensitive uh, pressure transducer, you will not see any hysteresis of the micropores. In your system, you have a 0 0.1 pressure transducer on the micropore ports. So you can, if you go to the, dis the desorption down to 0 0.001, you can see hysteresis in the micropores. Okay, usually you don't see it. People don't see it if you don't have very good pressure transducer. In your system, you can see it. You can see that if you are interested to see the hysteresis for the micropores. 
Krypton is just one, one word about Krypton. Okay? When we use Krypton, only when the surface area of the solid is very, very low, below 0.5 square meter per gram. Why? An example, just to show you why. If you, if you go to, uh, let me, that was one thing that show you can understand what the Krypton is. People use Krypton because they think Krypton is smaller than nitrogen. Wrong. Krypton molecules are larger than nitrogen, okay? We use Krypton at liquid nitrogen because the P0 is 2.5. Let me give you an example so you can see it. If you go to a football game, okay, and you have 1,000 people lo looking, watching the game, okay? If 10 of the people goes to the bathroom outside, for example, and you're there, you don't see it. You don't see, you make an observation, all right? But if you have 50 only and 10 of them go to the bathroom, you'll find out, with 20, for example, you have 20 here. If you go one out or two, I don't see it. But if you go five, then I can see it. So what's happening is different between the nitrogen and krypton. The P0 of krypton is 2.5. See, for example, let's take an example, P over P0 is 0 0.3. Okay, relative pressure. As I said, 0 0.3 is the last point on the BT equation. Okay, if the P0 at nitrogen is about 760, the P will be 760 times 0 0.3 is about 250 torr. 250 torr is correspond to about 10,000 molecules of nitrogen. Okay, so that's about 10,000 people in the football game. Now, if we do krypton, P0 is 2.5. We do the same thing, P over P0, 0 0.3. The pressure in this case will be 0 2.5 times 0 0.3 is 0 0.05, something like that. It is said to be 10,000, now we have 100, okay? So what's, what we are going is, we're going, we are, we are creating more sensitivity to the pressure transducer, okay? So the pressure transducer, you have, you, you have a pressure 2,250 uh, torr, for example, you have 10,000 molecules of nitrogen, and your sample absorbs only 10 molecules of nitrogen, the pressure transducer does not sense it. It says no absorption. But when you do krypton at liquid nitrogen, you have one 100 molecule and the sample absorbs 10, it says 10 percent. Then it's become very sensitive. It's just to increase the sensitivity of the pressure transducer. Not many people this. It was, I asked people and I said, no, because the krypton is smaller than nitrogen. It's much larger. It's 20, 21 instead of 16.5. So it's a big difference. The only thing we use krypton only if the surface area of the solid is below 0 0.5 square meter per gram. Okay? I think this we, it's just showing you here one, one example, it's just thermodynamic assessment. Not only the gas absorption can you give surface area, but we can do it by the entropy and by enthalpy of your system, okay? It's just uh, showing you this by free energy, I can also calculate the surface area. The same thing as that. This is exactly the same, the same numbers as you get with the BT surface area. So you do this, okay? So you calculate the surface area by free energy, and you can see here it's by a sample, it's BT 850, and if you add them together, get 840 square meter per gram if you measure the surface area here by the entropy. So I, I also, if you don't have gas absorption by the entropy, if you have TJ, for example, you can, or DSC, the, the, the differential scanning calorimeter, you can measure also surface area. Well, just an example, this is, I'm going to go faster. Zeolite, okay, like zeolite. Also, I can, I can measure surface area by zeolite, like this one here. And here I show you the difference between nitrogen, oxygen, argon, okay? You see nitrogen, how shift, okay? This is poor distribution, is smaller, much smaller than argon, okay? So it gives you wrong numbers. Okay, this is finished with the gas absorption, with the chemistry absorption. Okay, we can stop here. See you on time. Thank you. Any questions? It was, of course, I pushed it very fast. This is, I go very slowly. This is two days, three days course, but it's, I just put it in one hour. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. So join me to thank Dr. Yunus again. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So right now we'll have uh, a break, uh, but before that we have to do two things. First of all, I would like to thank again Dr. Yunus for uh, bringing his book with him. That's very generous from him. We would like to have uh, one copy signed by you, actually two copies signed by you. One will go in my office and the other we will de dedicate it to the AUB uh, Science Library so anyone would have access to it uh, to read it later on. So if we could have a pen, please.
Thank you.